absolutely real. They have they have pages and everything. Oh, I I thought that they'd be a nice durable cardboard. John Stoddard's Lectures it is a bona fide piece of printed matter. It fooled me. The fellow's a regular Belasco. It's a trial. I, I was brought here by Rosa, Roosevelt, Miss, Miss, Mrs. Claude Roosevelt. I haven't drunk for a week, but in the library, it's over up. So, so, <coughs> we are off. The Great Gatsby, Chapter 3. I hope you are ready to party! Let's just do a quick recap, though, of Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, we had a party in Manhattan at the Fantasy Relationship Apartment of Myrtle and Tom. The time was, quote, a few days before the 4th of July. We had two major locations, the Valley of Ashes and Manhattan. Our characters were Nick, Tom, Myrtle, and George Wilson, along with Catherine and the McKees. We had a dominant symbol in T.J. Eckelberg, and we spent some time with a sartorial analysis of Myrtle's dresses. For vocabulary, we had sensuously, vitality, and desolate. Chapter three's opening sentence. There was music from my neighbor's house through the summer nights. In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings and the champagne and the stars. On weekends, his Rolls Royce became an omnibus. And on Mondays, eight servants, including an extra gardener, toiled all day with mops and scrubbing brushes and hammers and garden shears, repairing the ravages of the night before. All right, well, everything about this is amazing, but let's start by focusing here on the comparison of men and girls, right? It's not boys and girls, it's not men and women, it's men and girls. And throughout this chapter, we're going to have this constant iteration of the fact that the women here at this party are significantly younger than the men. And then we get what they go. They go like moths, all right? So this is the simile, this is what you can compare. And what do moths do? Moths are drawn to light. What happens when moths hit the light? They get right. So to be attracted to light is dangerous. Coming to these parties is kind of an airhead thing to do as well. So people sit around laughing at moths for a while they're going and coming to the lights and the burnings. And they're drawn to whispering. We're gonna have themes here of quiet conversation as well as gossip. Champagne is going to introduce us to drinking and the stars, ideas of dreams and light. On weekends, the Rolls Royce, like a very fancy car, becomes an omnibus. It's stripped of its purpose as a marker of wealth and status and instead is rendered quotidian and utilitarian. And then we restart everything on Mondays, when the servants, notice that, this is about class, they toil all day to repair the ravages. Nice little R alliteration helps underscore the damage that happens because of these parties, which brings us back to those moths. 
Once the party starts, we get a really phenomenal shift in verb tense. So I'm gonna circle these as we go, and I hope you pick up on what Fitzgerald's doing. In the main hall, a bar with a real brass rail was set up and stocked with gins and liquors and cordials so long forgotten that most of his female guests were too young to know one from another. Quickly on the verbs, was set, stocked, forgotten, were. Next paragraph, by seven o'clock the orchestra has arrived. No thin five-piece affair, but a whole pit full of oboes and trombones and saxophones and viols and cornets and piccolos and low and high drums. The last swimmers have come in from the beach now and are dressing. A momentary hush. The orchestra leader varies his rhythm obligingly for her, and there is a burst of chatter as the erroneous news goes round that she is Gilda Gray's understudy at the Follies. The party has begun. Fitzgerald has thrown us into the immediacy of the party by switching from the past tense, was set, stocked, forgotten, were, to the immediate presence, has arrived, have come, are dressing, is, has begun. Here we are in the party. And now we're going to pull out again. Fitzgerald uses that tiny shift in verb tense to give us the sense that we, as readers, are at the party at the time that it's happening. One last final point here. We have erroneous news going around, right? The theme of gossip about this unnamed dancer. I was on my way to get roaring drunk from sheer embarrassment when Jordan Baker came out of the house and stood at the head of the marble steps, leaning a little backward and looking with contemptuous interest down into the garden. Got us some sweet male gaze and a body on a porch. If the great Gatsby loves anything, it loves bodies on porches standing still. Nick is saying he's going to get roaring drunk. He blames it on embarrassment. But remember, he just said in the previous chapter he's only been drunk twice in his life. So already we have reason to doubt that statement and it's always good to find these moments when you can doubt nick's veracity the truthiness of nick nick goes and finds a group of people to sit with you know there's something funny about a fellow that'll do a thing like that said the other girl eagerly he doesn't want any trouble with anybody who doesn't Gatsby, somebody told me. The two girls and Jordan leaned together confidentially. Somebody told me they thought he killed a man once. A thrill passed over us all. The three Mr. Mumbles bent forward and listened eagerly. I don't think it's so much that argued Lucille skeptically. It's more that he was a German spy during the war. One of the men nodded in confirmation. I heard that from a man who knew all about him, grew up with him in Germany, he assured us positively. Oh no, said the first girl. I couldn't be that because he was in the American army during the war. As our credulity switched back to her, she leaned forward with enthusiasm. You look at him. Sometimes when he thinks nobody's looking at him, I'll bet he killed a man. This is just the way rumors work, right? Everybody's curious about the actions of Gatsby. This word credulity means uh, belief, right? As our belief system switched to her. So the opposite of credulity is incredulity, incredulous. Everybody has a tale about Gatsby. We now come to the fellow that I uh, performed at the beginning of this video. Um, 
very famous scene. We might as well start with this idea of the owl-eyed man, owls and their association with knowledge, right? It's not just the fact that he has these round circular glasses, but those should remind you of our buddy TJX from the previous uh, paragraph, like right? looking down, we have now more eyes, more ideas of watchfulness and observation. This fellow has um, ascertained, and to ascertain something is to find out if it's certain, which is to test it for its truth quality, picking up on that idea of rumor. He was initially suspicious. Right? He thought they'd be cardboard, but they are real. And then he proves it to them by drawing them out. However, it doesn't go too far because he didn't cut the pages. So this refers to the fact that when you used to get books, if they were printed on a larger sheet, you'd have to fold that sheet over to fit it in between the cover. And then you had a pen knife and you would slit the top of the page in order to turn the page and read it more easily. Well. The idea of the year is um, he didn't cut the pages because he doesn't want anybody to ask him a question, right? If the owl-eyed man has seen that he's cut the pages, he'll assume he read them and go rushing to him in the party and be like, hey, my buddy Gatsby, what did you think about page 262 of Stoddard Lectures? And Gatsby would be like, oh man, I didn't read it. What do I do, right? If we were in class, this would be like when I call on people and they haven't done the reading. A couple of other words for real. Here we have bona fide and realism. So very nice. Also nice is um, he cries triumphantly and then he declares it a triumph. We have some good wordplay there. So this is an allusion to Belasco. Belasco was a famous set designer who revolutionized realism on the stage. People would declare that, my God, your set looks just like real life. So in other words, he's, his sets look real, but they're pretend. This is an idea of feigned reality. You might also compare Nick's description of himself in chapter one. Frequently, I have feigned sleep preoccupation. Right? He's tricked people. He's faked it. He's made something look real. So we see Gatsby's house as a performance space. Keep that in mind. And so we come to our first glimpse of Gatsby in person. And at this moment, Nick is going to do something very interesting. He is going to invite us as readers into his shared consciousness. He wants us to see what he sees. He smiled understandingly, much more than understandingly. It was one of those rare smiles with a quality of eternal reassurance in it that you may come across four or five times in life. It faced or seemed to face the whole external word, world for an instant and then concentrated on you with an irresistible prejudice in your favor. It understood you just so far as you wanted to be understood, believed in you as you would like to believe in yourself and assured you that it had precisely the impression of you that at your best you hoped to convey. Precisely at that point it vanished and I was looking at an elegant young roughneck, a year or two over 30, whose elaborate formality of speech just missed being absurd. Sometime before he introduced himself, I'd got a strong impression that he was picking his words with care. Of course, Nick also picks his words with care because he's writing this story for us. So there's something really nice about Gatsby fictionalizing his own everyday experiences and Nick fictionalizing everybody else's experiences that came in with contact to this fictional character and then Fitzgerald's at the highest end doing all of these levels. Something really great here is the constant correction. He smiled understandingly becomes much more. It faced becomes or seemed, and then the formality of speech just missed. Okay, but what I want you to concentrate on is this dense concatenation series of connections around the word you. The you is us, readers. He, Nick is trying to persuade us of the truth of this statement that if we were ever to encounter Gatsby, this is what we would feel. Another exchange. When he was gone, I turned immediately to Jordan, constrained to assure her of my surprise. 
I had expected that Mr. Gatsby would be a florid and corpulent person in his middle years. Who is he? I demanded. Do you know? Is just a man named Gatsby. Where is he from, I mean? And what does he do? Now you're started on the subject. She answered with a wan smile. Well, he told me once he was an Oxford man. A dim background started to take shape behind him, but at her next remark, it faded away. However, I don't believe it. Two things that I want to point out. First, this idea of expectation being overturned reminds us of the owl-eyed man. Something that I want to emphasize is that this is not disillusionment. Right? He didn't have a dream about him. All this is is expectations being overturned. So it might seem to you that there's some overlap between those two, but one is something, a change that's monumental to how you understand your world. Like when some, you are disillusioned, you lose the way that you saw the world as opposed to just having kind of built up a brief small fantasy without consequence in your mind. So to lose expectation lacks consequence that disillusionment has. Florid means like a flower, bright, like red-cheeked, corpulent, fat, fat. So he expected a fat, red-faced man rather than this like 31, 32-year-old. And then, of course, he's caught up, he being Nick, is caught up in who is Gatsby. You'll remember Daisy. Gatsby? What Gatsby? We also get a very interesting statement from Journey about the nature of parties. Anyhow, he gives large parties, said Jordan, changing the subject with an urbane distaste for the concrete. And I like large parties. They're so intimate. At small parties, there isn't any privacy. Um, I don't want to delve into this passage too much because I discuss it in the questions or I ask you to think about it. Uh, one, I want to point out a small pun though. Urbane means having to do with the urban, which is cities. And she says she has a distaste for the concrete and you find concrete in cities. And so there's this nice paradox within Jordan while she's also expressing this much larger paradox here about our large parties being more intimate. There's another fellow that I want to focus on. This is a drunk undergraduate. There were three married couples and Jordan's escort, a persistent undergraduate given to violent innuendo, and obviously under the impression that sooner or later Jordan was going to yield him up to her person to a greater or lesser degree. Um, the word violent, it picks up on two previous types of violence that we've had. We had the violent outburst of Myrtle, we had the physical violence of Tom, and now we have a violent innuendo here, also meaning forceful. Innuendo has to do with implication of sex or impropriety in your comments. And all of you are probably familiar with this, but it's the way in which you can talk about something salacious, something sexual, without using the blunt or straightforward terms. You imply it. And we get the sense that it's sexual because we have the idea of Jordan yielding, surrendering her body, her person, to some degree. Well, that doesn't happen. And later on, we see him, likely even more drunk, quote, eluding Jordan's undergraduate, who was now engaged in an obstetrical conversation with two chorus girls. Obstetrical means having to do with obstetrics, which is childbirth or the actions relating to it. Obstetrical is almost the opposite of innuendo. It's hyper-scientific. After the party, we have this kind of phenomenal scene of a car crash. But as I walked down the steps, I saw that the evening was not quite over. Fifty feet from the door, a dozen headlights illuminated a bizarre and tumultuous scene. In the ditch, beside the road, right side up but violently shorn of one wheel, rested a new coupe, which had left Gatsby's drive not two minutes before. The sharp jut out of a wall accounted for the detachment of the wheel, which was now getting considerable attention from half a dozen curious chauffeurs. However, 
as they had left their cars blocking the road, a harsh discordant din from those in the rear had been audible for some time and added to the already violent confusion of the scene. So we've moved from inside and allowed chaotic energy from music, which is not discordant, it is the opposite, it's euphonous, and now we have this violent breaking, this violent destruction of a piece of mechanized technology. The scene continues. Turns out that somebody gets out of the car. The fact was infinitely astonishing to him, and I recognized first the unusual quality of wonder and then the man. He was the late patron of Gatsby's library. How did it happen? He shrugged his shoulders. I know nothing whatever about mechanics, he said decisively. But how did it happen? Did you run into the wall? Don't ask me, said Owl Eyes, washing his hands of the whole matter. I know very little about driving. Next to nothing, it happened, and that's all I know. Well, if you're a poor driver, you ought to try driving at night. I, I wasn't even trying, he explained indignantly. I wasn't even trying. An odd hush fell upon the bystanders. Do you want to commit suicide? You're lucky it was just a wheel, a bad driver, and not even trying. You don't understand, explained the criminal. I wasn't driving. There's another man in the car. The shot that followed this declaration found voice in a sustained, ah, 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 as the door of the coupe swung slowly open. A lot read to say something simple, the idea that you are guilty until you prove your own innocence. As much as you try to declare that you don't know what's going on, everybody will assume that you do. We now have a tonal shift at the end of the car accident scene. The caterwauling horns had reached a crescendo and I turned away and cut across the lawn toward home. I glanced back once, a wafer of a moon was shining over Gatsby's house, making the night fine as before, and surviving the laughter and the sound of his still glowing garden. A sudden emptiness seemed to flow now from the windows and the great doors, endowing with complete isolation the figure of the host who stood on the porch, his hand up in a formal gesture of farewell. And then there's this break. Reading over what I have written so far, I see I have given the impression that the events of three nights several weeks apart were all that absorbed me. On the contrary, they were merely casual events in a crowded summer, and until much later, they absorbed me infinitely less than my personal affairs. This is all he cares about, and he quickly provides just a couple of pages making stuff up. Now, I mean, it probably did happen to him, but he's obsessed with this. It absorbed him. Um, notice how he says what I've written so far, right? There's a self-awareness of this is a written product. And just quickly, we had Gatsby isolated on the porch standing there. So an image that we've seen frequently, the chapter ends with Nick and Jordan starting to date and they have this conversation. You're a rotten driver, I protested. Either you ought to be more careful or you oughtn't to drive at all. I am careful. No, you're not. Well. Other people are, she said lightly. What's that got to do with it? They'll keep out of my way, she insisted. It takes two to make an accident. Suppose you met somebody just as careless as yourself. I hope I never will, she answered. I hate careless people. That's why I like you. This will raise the question of just how careful is Nick, but notice how this conversation, where it comes from, She's already had her own share of accidents. It's building out of that previous conversation about accusations of guilt when it comes to driving, who was driving, and she has this phenomenal comment, it takes two to make an accident. Is that true? What is Jordan implying? Well, she's implying that even if you're at innocent in an accident, if somebody else hits you, you are still guilty for having been in the way even though you couldn't help it, you were there. And so you're a guilty party. It's an astonishingly solipsistic, self-centered way of viewing the world because it lets you never take full credit. Questions for you. One, how do you understand Jordan's paradox that large parties are intimate? 
Number two, what do you make of the last sentence of the chapter? Quote, I am one of the few honest people that I have ever known. End quote. Is this a true statement? Why might it be true in Nick's opinion? Number three, the allusion to Belasco invites us to consider performance. What are three different types of performance in this chapter? All right. I hope you got a lot out of this. That was quite a bit. You might need to rewatch or re-engage. Make sure you are reading because a lot of this will be incomprehensible without that. And otherwise, I will see you on Monday for a poetry analysis and then Tuesday for chapter four.